welcome to my next lecture. Today we talk about peak oil and fracking. But before we come to oil, let's go back to coal. Last time I explained to you that the coal mainly was produced by dying plants about 300 million years ago. It lasted about 60 million years before the big production of coal stopped due to fungi that are able to digest lignin and therefore the main part of the plants are not converted anymore to coal but before that they are eaten up by fungi bacteria and all kind of other animals. So this deposit of coal is there since millions of years and when we started consumptions about 170 years ago we used up already a big fraction of that until today and people have calculated that it takes about 400 years roughly until we have taken out all the coal out of the ground which is accessible if we continue to produce coal at the same speed as we do at the moment. So in other words it's a total of about 600 years uh, in which we burn away all the existing coal which has been created in about 60 million years. And of course if you think about it this is not sustainable at all. So it took about 100,000 years to produce a coal which we consume in one year. So it's a factor of 1 to 100,000 and clearly completely unsustainable. To get a better feeling again, if we go back to the plot which I showed you at the beginning of the lecture series, there we had the last 10,000 years of mankind and I showed you there was the rise of uh, population which is very steep and I told you the rise of population has to do with fossil fuels and with the energy consumption or at least it's coinciding with it. If I show you on this time scale the accessibility of fossil fuels and we know that oil will not last very long anymore, gas also not infinitely and the longest accessible fossil fuel is coal which uh, lasts for about 400 years. Then on this time scale you see clearly this is only a sharp peak in the whole time of mankind. So even if you just talk about accessibility of fossil fuels, uh, we know that is not sustainable and that cannot last forever. So on a longer time scale this is, as I showed you, just a short peak and at least afterwards we would have to think about a sustainable energy uh, production again. So this discussion is quite old already and I go now from coal to oil and there's a prediction from the year 1956 about the world oil production and at that time already people realized that the amount of oil which exists is limited. So it starts with the blue area that is the production of oil before 1956, which was known at that time. Then you have the prediction, which is the green area. So this is a production from the part of the oil where the people knew that it should exist underground. And then it continues as a maximum somewhere. The maximum of the oil production is called peak oil. And after the maximum, at some point, it has to go down. And at that time, people estimated how much oil there is still undiscovered underground and um, they had an estimate on how long it will take until all the oil is used up on our world. This is an old plot and today the plot looks a bit different. There have been much more oil resources found that predicted at that time. One also has to admit that um, the scientists who produced this kind of plots, of course, had 
uh, strong relations to the oil company and the oil companies always try to um, reduce the estimates of oil to make it more valuable so that they can get more money from it. So in this sense, the question of course is, was the prediction wrong? Because um, people didn't know it better or was there also a bias from the oil companies on it? In any case, this is not my main point now. So let's take the same assumption, but not for the whole world now, but only for the United States. So only the uh, 48 states in the, in the US, except Alaska. So on this plot, you see the red line. The red line is a prediction from 1956 for the US. And the green line is the actual oil production. So in this respect, the prediction for the US was not so wrong. The scale here is in BBLS, billion barrels per year. Don't care about this strange units. If you talk about energy, everybody uses different scales, different units. I should have a lecture about it at some point. In principle, you could convert everything in joule or in kilowatt hours, but let's not do this at the moment. So what did you see? You see the peak oil for the uh, prediction in red and you see the peak oil for the actual production in the US and these things coincident quite well. But if you look at the later years, you see the prediction was that there is no oil left in the US and you see the green curve rises again. The green curve which is the actual oil production includes fracking. Fracking is a new way to get oil out of the soil and I will talk about it in a second. Oil production has geostrategical importance of course because all our industry and our life depends on oil. When the industrialized countries do not have enough oil themselves anymore, then they depend on external countries and in our world it has been for a long time that we were depending especially on the uh, countries in the Arabic area, so the Gulf region. And in the Gulf region, there is an almost infinite amount of oil. And this geostrategical importance is also shown here on this plot. It was in the years 1973 and then later in 1979 that there was the oil crisis. The oil crisis was induced by an embargo by the oil producing countries. They reduced the amount of oil which they produced and therefore prices went up very steeply. Of course, they could only do it because the industrialized countries did not have enough oil themselves anymore. There was a power just given by the fact that certain countries had a large amount of fossil fuels which other countries did not have. I don't want to go into these political questions here, I just want to bring to your attention that the conflict between industrialized countries, especially the United States and the Gulf region, uh, was very strong. There was always uh, the question for the US where to get enough oil for their large consumption. And it's probably not a coincidence that the drop of oil production in the US is somehow correlated with all the wars we had in this area. It started with the Iran-Iraq war, then the Gulf war, the bombing of the Iraq, uh, the, then the real Iraq war, war, which ended only at the point here uh, where at the same time fracking was ramping up in the US. So somehow there seems to be a correlation between um, 
these political issues and energy production. But of course, that is not our subject here. I just wanted to mention it. So in the recent years, especially in the last 10 years, fracking became very important so that we should talk about more in detail what this fracking is about and how it works. It's a technology which is highly controversial, but as a physicist, I have to say it's a very nice technology. Um, it is quite sophisticated and seems to work quite well. So what is the idea? So the idea is um, there are areas where there is oil. You dig a hole and the oil comes out and you just have to collect it. This is the standard oil production. But then there are areas underground where the oil is um, not flowing freely, where it's mixed with sand or with certain kinds of geological structures. And these structures, they include either oil, also petroleum, or also natural gas. So that is then called the shale gas and the shale oil. So if you dig a hole there, nothing comes out usually. Then engineers had the trick that they drill down a hole into this area that can be up to 3000 meters deep. And then with the modern technologies, you can, as shown in this picture here, you can uh, change the direction of your drilling and you drill a hole which is horizontal to the formation which contains the shale gas or shale oil. So now you have a pipe going through there and it goes into the area where this shale gas and the shale oil is. How do you now get out these things? Well, there's a certain fraction in these rocks or in this uh, shale areas which contain this um, fossil fuels and one way to get it is you put a liquid in and you put the liquid out and in this liquid then you have part of this gas or this oil. To do that efficiently it's of course not enough to have um, the, to, to have just the area around your pipe so you have to access all the surrounding of this pipe. So what you do now is you crack the stones there and you do that by putting uh, liquid into these pipes at a very high pressure. So the pressure goes up to something like several hundred bars. You know one bar is the pressure of the air here, two bar is what you have in addition typically in your car tires. So two bars is already a lot and several hundred bars of course. This is enough to break cracks into the area where you want to get the oil out. The fracking fluid is to a large extent normally water, like 90% water. But then you have additives in it, so-called propens, which contain material uh, that has different purpose in there. The first purpose is that if you put high pressure and you crack the stones, if you take the liquid out again, the cracks close and you want to avoid that. So you put some material in which leaves the cracks open, for example sand. So you have to add sand to your water. The next thing is uh, what you want to take out of the earth has a very high viscosity sometimes, but you want that it flows very much better. So to improve lubrication and to reduce the viscosity, you add additional materials, additional chemicals to, to your liquid. So you have a better flow. Then you add, for example, acids or other things which change the pH value against corrosion of your pipes, for example. You can add gases, you they sometimes add LPGs, liquid petroleum gas. And 
They also add biocides and disinfection materials because they do not want that there are bacteria or other things growing inside of these um, cracking areas. In this sense, um, the fluid which you press into the stones down deep down there has many additives and normally most of them are not known to the public because it is a secret of the companies doing so. How do you now get back the oil and the gas which you want? Well, once you put the high pressure in, then you release the pressure and then it takes hours or weeks that all the liquid flows back due to the pressure of the stones and it comes back up in your pipe and then um, this is called the backflow and this backflow then contains the oil or the gas which you want to extract. So this looks all quite nice. So this is a very efficient way to get material, fossil fuels out of the ground even if it's hidden in sand or in in certain geological structures where it's more or less bound inside. But now what is the risk? The risk of this method is uh, manifold. The most important one is on the water cycle. So our lecture is about energy, water and carbon. So fracking is something which connects all the three, for example. So we take out the carbon, we produce energy from it, but what about the water? Well. In most methods, you need about 90% of the liquid, uh, which is water. In other methods, you use petroleum and other things, which is even more difficult. So let's talk about the one where you use water. The water, of course, has to be acquired on the ground. So you need an area where there's enough fresh water. Then you add all the additional chemicals. You pump it into the ground and at some point later it comes back and in this backflow then you have not only your fossil fuels, your gas or petroleum, but of course you also have uh, all the chemicals, biocides and whatever you put in there as a wastewater. So you have to get rid of the wastewater. So either you have to treat it or you have to dispose it. You can also use part of it again for the next cycle. But in any case, at some point you have to get rid of this poisonous um, wastewater. In addition to the things which you put in to the water at the beginning already, you bring up new material from the deep grounds. So if you dig some, in some areas deep underground, you find a lot of material which is also um, poisonous or dangerous, for example arsenic or strontium, so radioactive substances come up with the water and that of course you also have to dispose. In addition to the water you bring back, you also have a different kind of problem which comes from cracks. So you do this hydraulic fracturing and um, by putting the pressure in the ground, you produce cracks and sometimes you also induce seismic events. So the ground is starting to shake and produces new cracks somewhere. And in this effect, it can in principle also happen that this is not only closely around the pipe which you put in, but it can also be cracks which lead to the groundwater so that due to the high pressure underground some of this uh, wastewater comes up and goes into the groundwater. And what is even more likely is that some of the pipes which go from the ground down to the deep area where you have your cracking, that some of these pipes crack and then you have a leak and the wastewater comes out of the leak and goes into the groundwater. This is of course not what you want, but it's hard to prevent it. There are some films which show you pictures that you see um, people opening tap water 
and the tap water contains so much gas that the water tap is burning. This, if you see it from the funny side, is quite practical. You don't need an extra gas pipe and you can still cook your spaghetti with your water pipe. You get the water out and you also get the methane out of your water pipe and you can use it for cooking. But um, being seriously, of course, there are two aspects here. First of all, these things also happen in normal gas production or in areas where there is a lot of methane underground. Also there it can be that part of the water is contaminated with methane, but of course not at the intensity, not at the high concentration so that you can put a lighter to your water tap and there's a flame coming out. People estimate that the shale gas production has about 10% of leakage, which means that up to 10% of the gas which you bring up from the ground leak out either in pipes or by going into the groundwater and other things. So this is really a serious problem of shale gas and it's much stronger there than in normal gas production. Therefore, now we have to go back to the next picture about global warming. So in one of my previous lectures, I showed you already this diagram of the last 400,000 years and plotted is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And I showed you that this was at a very um, low level, quite constant. And only since the industrialization, there is this high peak of CO2, this large rise of CO2. Um, in the next lecture we talk about climate change. So what we will learn is that this CO2 is a greenhouse gas which increases the temperature of the earth. In any case what you should remember now is that since the industrialization the amount of CO2 is rising due to the use of fossil fuels, therefore we call it the anthropogenic CO2. The CO2 has a certain potential, we call it the global warming potential, GWP, and it's arbitrarily set to 1 for CO2. With this unit now we can go to another gas and we go now to CH4, to methane. And in this plot you see a similar thing. In the last 800,000 years, the methane concentration in the atmosphere was also quite constant. You see the same wiggles over this time, which have to do with ice ages, so with the climate on the Earth. But also here you see a steep rise in the last 100 years about, so during industrialization, also the anthropogenic methane appeared on Earth, so the methane which is due to the activities of mankind. And this comes from the gas production, from the methane production due to leaks. But in addition, of course, also there are other effects like agricultures, uh, like cows, for example, produce a lot of methane. Um, all that together gives you the anthropogenic methane production. And the bad thing about methane is now that if this goes into the atmosphere, it also is a greenhouse gas, it also does global warming. However, the efficiency is 25 times as large. So that means if you have one kilogram of methane, it has the same effect as 25 kilograms of CO2. So methane is much more dangerous to the atmosphere. There's a second plot here where you see that in a larger time scale. So this plot starts in 1988 or so and you see it's rising since then. And you also see there's a yearly up and down of this curve. This yearly change has to do with agriculture. Therefore, in summer and winter there is a difference, but the general trend is that it's going up, which means that the methane concentration in 
our atmosphere is rising. And part of it is agriculture, but part of it is the use of natural gas. There have been a lot of people who said that we have to get rid of fossil fuels and because this is so difficult, we should switch instead from coal to gas. Why is that? Because for the same amount of energy in gas, you produce less CO2 than in coal. And therefore people called the gas a bridging technology, which you can use to bridge from the time where you use a lot of fossil fuels to the time where you could do everything with renewable energies. So the, in this sense, the switch from coal to gas reduces the CO2 output of our civilization. However, and now that's the important point why I show you these diagrams. However, if there are leaks, where gas is coming out of the pipes and the gas is distributed into the atmosphere instead of being burned, then you increase the methane concentration in the atmosphere and this has an effect of 25 worse than CO2. So in this sense, gas as a bridging technology works only if you have a gas production which does not leak where there are no methane leaks. If you have a pipe to distribute it from, for example, Russia to Germany, of course you can try to get rid of all the leaks. But if you do fracking and you have a um, leakage of maybe, for example, 10%, then of course um, this is not a good choice. And in fracking you might have leaks everywhere underground due to the cracks which you have and the high pressure you are using and therefore um, fracking is probably not an option as a bridging technology. Okay, so that is all I want to tell you today. My next lecture will then be about the greenhouse effect and global warming in more detail. So if you go back to my book for example now, we are still in the second chapter, the nexus of energy, carbon and water. And we will start next time with the chapter 2.4, the chapter about the greenhouse effect, which we started already in a sense today. Thank you and I hope to see you again in the next lecture. Thank you.